Hey, I'm Benjamin Curley, and you're listening to the Story to Screen podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Story to Screen podcast, the movie podcast where we review all different kinds of movies every week. I'm your host, Chris, and today with me is my co-host from last week. We reviewed the first Hobbit movie, The Unexpected Journey. Uh, with me again is uh, Benjamin Curley. Hey. Hey, what's up? Hey, I'm doing good. How about yourself? Good, good. What you been up to lately? Oh, not too much work and getting over cold, so that's uh, about it. Uh, uh, I know what that's like. Just me, it was work and... Uh, trying to get some stuff ready for a craft fair, and uh, we just had that today, and it was a uh, very successful. We had some, we had a lot of people in today, and uh, made a lot of money, at least on my part. So excellent. So well, today we're going to be reviewing the uh, the second part in uh, the Hobbit trilogy, The Hobbit: The Desolation of Smaug. Truly, the tales and songs. Fall utterly short of your enormity, O oh, Smaug, the stupendous. So, uh, last week, uh, we reviewed the first film, and we pretty much had a very mutual um, opinion on it. We, we liked it enough, but we felt like, but we felt it, it had some flaws to it that, unfortunately, mm-hmm. could either... That could be carried on to the next film and hurt it, or it could possibly improve it. So, my question to you is, does the second film, is it a better film, or does it fall below everything? Hmm. I don't think it's... I don't think it's any worse than the first one. I think it complements the first one really well. I think, um, you know, as, as a standalone film, I probably enjoyed it a little bit more than the first one as a standalone film, but I think, I think it really helps complement the first film, and together they, they work a lot better now. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing what the third one, how it rounds it all out, but as a second film, I think it's one I would more readily watch a second time than the first one. Okay. I'm going to use this comparison. Very interesting comparison. Um, yeah, many years ago, there was this uh, a series of films that was well loved and adored by many fans. And many years later, the the same filmmakers decided to uh, continue with that story. But when that film was released back in 1999, it was it while it was commercially successful, it was hated. By many, many people and the diehard fans of that particular group. Mm-hmm. That uh, So here's my opinion on The Desolation of Smaug. The Desolation of Smaug is the Phantom Menace of Lord of the Rings films. <laughs> you hated it, huh? Dude. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be Lord of the Rings. I knew that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And see, I think maybe I watched maybe to the detriment of this movie. I watched the first three movies, and then The Hobbit. <laughs> so you really had high expectations. Well, my expectations were pretty reserved. I knew going into this, as I said last week, I I really hope that this could be better than Two Towers. Mm-hmm. It doesn't come close to Two <laughs> Towers. I'm sorry. And honestly, I would rank it below everything. <laughs> I was... That was... There was just way too much CGI for my taste. And they... It felt like a video game. The action scenes were very, very video game-ish. And mm. I wasn't really connecting with that world that I loved so much. And, I mean, while the Hob- the first Hobbit movie, I think, is is a is a good if not decent companion piece to the trilogy i would i i think that's more of a masterpiece than this one 
<laughs> uh, I I wasn't connecting with the movie. I was just anticipating when things were gonna continue to kick in, but it, it moved at such a not a slow pace, but it wasn't really a bringing me bringing me into this world type of mm-hmm. film. I wasn't getting that, and I was so. Like by the time we got into like the day uh, in the t- uh, was yeah the, the the Lake Town stuff that's where the movie started kind of ramping up, but then after the fantastic Smaug sequence, everything just everything just started going downhill for me, man. It, it I was just I was so disappointed. Well, here's here's my here's why I think Peter Jackson took that direction. He's in the first film. In the, in the first trilogy with Lord of the Rings, he cut so much out of the books because he had to reach a brand new audience. He had, to, he had to build a fan base. He had to bring it to people who had never read the books and so on and so forth. Now here we are with The Hobbit. We've got a huge fan base. We've got a diehard fan base still, people who are like, you know, book only sort of people. But then we've got a whole group of people who just love the universe they they love that world and they just they eat it up and they were the people who grew up like me on the lord of the rings Mm -hmm. and so because there is such a huge fan base for it peter jackson doesn't really have to worry about um bringing them in bring yeah it doesn't have to worry so much about about creating a perfect story as as or a, a compelling story as much he just he just he can kind of roll his way back into the book and it doesn't really have to be well done these are definitely not academy award winners or 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 uh, oscars at all this he's not he's not going to get it for story on this in no. any way no he's just he's basically he, well he's doing what disney used to do with so many movies where they'd milk a series they you know um they do Pocahontas 2 and all these other that they just they tried to recreate exactly the same thing as the first one and that's what he's kind of doing here um in the sense of story he's being very lazy with the story and he just bringing us back into the world and just telling it kind of straight as it is plus throwing in some ties with the Lord of the Rings so it's not it's not as um excellently done as the first uh trilogy yeah Yeah. um you know, I, I didn't read any reviews. Here's another thing. I didn't read any reviews going to this movie. So I was pretty fresh. I was pretty fresh going to this movie. And, um, I mean, the only thing I had heard was that it had... It's actually better than the first. So I'm like, oh, okay. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. And then, and then what's his name? Uh, Richard Coloris, I think, from the from the um, uh, Time magazine, actually put it in his top, the top ten best films of the year. Which... That, that's think, something, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something for someone who hasn't seen The Hobbit yet. So that's yeah. saying a lot. Um, so I still went into it, still pretty reserved. I'm like, okay, let's see where this goes. And very, then, very hopeful, yeah. Very mm-hmm. hopeful, very hopeful, and that really gave me expectations. And I think it 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 is nowhere near the what people have been saying. You know, I mean, it's gotten a pretty positive reception. Have you looked at the the reviews lately? Well, I I haven't really looked at reviews. I've just been kind of watching Facebook, and as people see it, I've just been reading their impressions. And a lot of people, yeah, they didn't... uh, I'm hearing the same things that I did with the first movie. The same complaints. The complaints are too long, um, the story was not engaging, and then bad CGI. Yes. So basically, The Hobbit uh, encompasses everything that... uh, Chapter 7 to, I think to chapter uh, chapter 12, I believe, Inside Information. So it basically encompasses those those first couple chapters. And those are some really, actually those are some of the best parts in the book. Like the Merkwood mm-hmm. stuff and, oh, yeah. and the Lake Town stuff is pretty engaging. I've got to say, I was, I was kind of a little disappointed with some of those things. Like, um... The Merkwood stuff? Yeah. It was I was I was a little bit disappointed with that too. They really it was not nearly as drawn out as it was in the book where they really you know, they 
know, they attempted to catch the elves and then they escaped. And it, it, the Mirkwood scene didn't quite capture what was in the book. I agree there. Yeah, it, and then, um, well, let me just say this. I, I, I thought Linda Bloom was actually really good. He wasn't, I, I thought it was going to be, a, I thought he was going to be forced. And while he, he didn't really do anything for the plot, mm -hmm. I thought he was serviceable. But I thought it was great to see him again as well. Yeah, yeah. So, but um, now a lot of people um, were very nervous about the, Tariel, is that how you pronounce it? Tariel, the uh, Evangeline Lily character? Yeah. Okay. She, um, I thought she was fine. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, not, I did not expect the direction that they took her. Okay. Um, I did not expect that at all, no. No, and, and, and honestly, there, people were kind of making it seem like there was going to be a, a huge love story between her and... Uh, That's what the trailer gave the impression of, Yeah. Well, not just between her and uh, and um, and Legos, but between her and uh, Keeley, I mm -hmm. thought there was I thought there was going to be something a little bit more there, but it's just there. It didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, but I thought she was I thought she was fine. I didn't think she was horrible. I thought I thought that whole thing was either going to be laughable, <laughs> yeah, or it was going to work. And it just it, it's kind of in the middle for me. Did you see this movie in three D? No, I didn't. You didn't. Oh, what, 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 what did you see it in? It was just, it was just two D in a regular theater, not even high frame rate or anything. So. Okay, I saw it in that, in that format as well, and I, and I believe I might have. If I saw it again, my problems with it, with it would probably, would would probably diminish. But I have got to, I've got to say the, uh, the action, very tight in terms of camera close ups. Like you couldn't really tell. I noticed that too. Yeah, there were. It was it was very the camera work was kind of getting on my nerves a little bit at some places. Yes. Um, the thing about the camera work that Peter Jackson chose there to to use um, it really only works in fantasy type films. It wouldn't work anywhere else, and as such, it can kind of get on my nerves a little bit because it's it's very it's, it's not traditional camera work, and so it kind of it can kind of make you sick a little bit because you're like, okay, which way is up, you know? Yeah, and and and, and because, the, honestly, another thing, too, was there were so many um, CGI orcs in this <laughs> movie, and I was so disappointed that there was hardly any practical orcs in the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, well, there was like one or a couple of scenes here and there with the uh, with practical orcs, but there weren't really a whole lot. No, he does. He really does need to get back to some practical sets like he did. I mean, Helm's Deep, that was that was amazing. He needs to get back to stuff like that. Where oh, they he... use some miniature work and yeah. Yeah, I mean, even Delgador, which we can talk about that in just a minute, but even Delgador and uh and even Lake Town. Oh my gosh, Lake Town, while there was a combination of practical effects, the, the mm -hmm. Delgador um wasn't really there. I could tell that was a CGI image. That oh yeah, yeah. it didn't feel like a model. When you look at Lord of the Rings, the, the, when they would do the um, like the big sets and or the like the castles or or Minas Tirith or Helm's Deep, that was a combination of real life of real life sets or models. Yeah, they didn't. No, I I think that's how the best filmmaking works is when you is when you integrate all of that together oh yeah and you believe it and and honestly for a long time i actually thought the helm's deep they built a whole helm's deep set and I, it looks that good no you really do you really do believe that the whole thing is completely built and you don't realize till afterwards that no they actually it was miniature now the, you know the, the the main wall there was built to scale but then the background was all miniature the, yeah, the actual the keep itself was miniature yeah yeah and then when when you look at when you look at uh, Del Gador, it it really felt like again something that I said last week. The ending kind of the ending felt kind of like Doctor Seuss. There's a there's you know like in the Doctor Seuss world, there's the structure of those worlds are very very um, very unnatural. Yeah, unnatural, mm -hmm. and it's very cartoonish. But again, there's something about it like all these different entrances and. The, the skyscraper the skyscrapers are, are, are yeah it doesn't so it doesn't weird. seem it doesn't seem like it was actually built to be usable yeah yeah it seemed 
unpractical. It, mm-hmm. it was just it was just bizarre. Now you you criticize the the Lord of the Rings aspect, the, the Lord of the Rings subplots uh, in the last film. I it, did, and and I actually I think I think the second film makes them work now. Really, mm-hmm. I would I would agree. But I felt the, the distract. The thing that I was disappointed with with that whole thing was the way that they presented Sauron. It was cool, <laughs> but I'm looking at this, and this reminded me of a Super Smash Brothers fight. <laughs> Seriously, it did. You, you expect to see the health bars above their head, you know. <laughs> 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 Get it closed up. Oh, heart gone. Okay, revive. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, even when Azog is talking to Sauron, he he's not even a mist. He's he, what is that? I I don't. It, it felt like a shadow or something, and I didn't even realize it was Sauron. I was thinking, it, you know, it was one of the Nazgul, perhaps. Yeah, and I wasn't thinking Sauron. But I, I actually found that the effect where the eye shows up was kind of cool. It was. It was mm-hmm. cool, and then, and then, and then this is a, this was actually really cool. This was a really cool idea. The whole, like the eye, it's actually Sauron. The, the yeah, physical the, form. The, yeah, his his silhouette. Yeah, from from the uh, from the first movie. Yeah, yeah, from the prologue. That was, that was really cool. That was and that's, that's that's who, that's what made it very clear. Oh, that's Sauron to me. That's what it took to make it extremely clear to me. Yeah. I was expecting a little bit more of a uh, a more physical appearance uh, because you know th- because that's Benedict Cumberpatch actually doing the uh, the, the necromancer Sauron mm. stuff. So I thought he was going to come out and look like Sauron before he like he, underneath all that armor from the prowl. I thought we were going to get something like that or maybe like a spirit form or something like that. Yeah, I mean, well, he can't. We know from the first from the Lord of the Rings that he can't take physical form anymore. Yeah, that's, that's they, true. They, they do say that there, so we can't, we're kind of limited in that way. Yeah, but I wouldn't be opposed to like him appearing in some sort of like a, a spirit, but having some sort of physical shape, you know what I mean? Some sort of a physical. Yeah. Even something, it's just a sh- something more recognizable. Or, yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have mind that at all. But the Workwood stuff, like the whole barrel sequence... That, that yeah, come on, admit it was really funny. It was funny, <laughs> and maybe in three D, that scene, I would appreciate that scene more in three D. Probably so, yeah. But I felt like that was so over the top that it took me out of it. Really, honestly, it, <laughs> it really it was so over the top. It really was extremely dramatized. But that's what I. That's kind of what I envision when I read the book. Truthfully, really? very comical. Um, children's tale, and so that that kind of fits with that theme a little bit. I like the lightheartedness of that scene. Yeah, um, it, but however, I, I I think he went maybe overboard. You can kind of yeah. I think you can make that argument that he definitely went overboard mm-hmm. um, with the the childish with the children's story. And and I understand he's tr- this is a different time, a different place. But you can do that better without it. Yeah, being, you want us. You, Again, it's like that old saying, you want us to laugh with you, not at you. And I found (laughs) the scene to be kind of laughable in some way. But I will say this, the bumper (laughs) battle station barrel was awesome. That way it was. It was really cool. That was... (laughs) was Like, whoa, I did not expect that. That is hilarious. That was was probably the most... That was probably... The be- one of the be- better things about the movie that that really like okay that that was funny, but mm-hmm. um, when Legolas is going around killing these orcs and again they're CG orcs and you can tell that they're that they're just hitting mid air or something like that. you can tell that they're not hitting it's not it's not blending that well no no and that can I ask you this did there did it feel like there were several shots that didn't look complete. Because that, there were several times where it looked like the visual effects were incomplete at times. And I don't know if that's... I've heard a couple people complain about that. Yeah, um, I I would say... And there were... Yeah, the one the one thing that stands out to me is the, um, the liquid gold. Okay. It didn't... 
Well, we won't talk too much about that, but yeah. You, you yeah, know. that's what stood out to me. It's like, surely they could have done something that looked a little bit better, that looked less like a pre and more like a final product. Yeah, oh, well, we'll, we'll get into that whole thing yeah. later well, on. That, that's, what, that's what looked incomplete to me. That's the main thing that stood out. Yeah. yeah. I will say a positive. There's a positive. I think the, the acting was pretty good in this one. Um, I felt... Now, one of the things that I was really curious... The whole the Bilbo's relationship with the with the ring, I don't think they played it up enough to where I felt like the ring is beginning to have some sort of psychological effect on him. Mm-hmm. Um, but for one moment after he has the the whole fight with the spiders, I actually thought for one moment he was going to say, "My precious." Yeah, I, I I go the opposite direction. I think he did. I think uh, they did too much with that actually. Oh. Um, because in the book, it's very clear that the ring has little to no effect whatsoever on him. He's just using it all the time. And so I think they're going a little bit too far because, I mean, how many years are there between The Hobbit and uh, The Lord of the Rings? I mean, it's like... 60 years. Okay. The ring will have a long time to take effect um, on him. And I, I think I think they kind of rush the process a little bit there. That's what I feel like. Okay. But I... But here's my thing. I wasn't convinced. There, there's something odd about it that I wasn't really convincing me about it. It, I, it felt. It didn't feel right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I wouldn't. I wouldn't have mind him like him looking at it a little bit more or touching it, and then something kind of similar to what Frodo did. Like you could begin to see that <clears throat> those early signs that the ring is, yeah, is kind of taking hold of him, on on him. But not, but not yet. It's it's building up. It's it building up, but not. It's not quite there yet. Yeah. When we see fellowship. Now we got a new character in the movie. Uh, Luke Evans as Bard. Here he's presented with a little bit of mystery. There's something going on here that I'm not too sure mm-hmm. where, where they're going with it. Uh, in the in the movie or in the book, he's presented more as a a captain of the guard. Yeah, he is. He is a very heroic character that's just looked up to by everyone. Yes. Yeah. And um, in, in here, he's more like a um, a lower class. Um, he's, well, he's kind of a Han Solo, almost. But he's, he's kind of, he's kind of, no one really, he just does his job and, you know, but he has no like, one really looks up to him. Yeah, but he kind of has some emotional baggage because he's a widower which is not mm-hmm. in the book, but I didn't mind that actually. I, 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 if nothing more, I felt like they they gave him some more to some more stuff to to play with, I guess. Because in the book, it's 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 pretty ba- it's pretty straightforward that he's a, uh, a a captain of the guard or something like that. Yeah. But apparently, in the movie, he had an ancestor who was there the day that the dragon came down onto the mountain. I guess was killed, but he, uh, failed. Or failed killing the the dragon. Um, Something, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, in the book, uh, spoiler alert, we're going to get a little spoiler here, but in the book, I think he becomes the either the, the new master or or the king, I, I think. Something like that, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where this whole thing is, is going, because I think there's more to him than what they're saying on the, on the, on the screen there. I, I actually think they might actually go down that route where he's going to be the new master of Lake Town. Like this... Well, they've certainly put him in a position where he could. Yeah. So yeah. speaking of the, speaking of the, the master of Lake Town and, uh, his little, <laughs> did you... that was, that was unusual. That, that felt, Very I don't cool. know. It, it didn't, it didn't feel like Lord of the Rings when we got into Lake Town. Yes. It felt more like a Renaissance or medieval film. Yeah. It, what was the, it felt like Scandinavian. Something, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was something Scandinavian about it, and the, well, it, was the, it was the it was the ice and yeah, yeah, and the the and the, the, the outfit. I loved yes. I loved Bard's coat. I love Bard's coat. That was awesome. Oh yeah. But what did you think of Bard in this movie? I, I thought he did good. I thought he was a really good addition, but I didn't think he they they did enough with him. If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. I, I liked I liked the backstory they gave him. Truthfully, that it gives him. It makes him a very interesting character that we want to see overcome that that past. We, we want to see him rise above that and prove himself, and we we know he can. We're just we're just waiting for him to get an opportunity to. Yeah. He's he's almost kind of a an Aragorn type of character. 
Yeah, where he's got it, he's got a past, and he just that he may not, may or may not be proud of, and he's yeah. got to rise above that. Yeah. yeah. Here's another thing too. Like earlier this year, I actually saw some uh, behind the scenes footage uh, at a live event that they were, uh, that they had online uh, with the the Lake Town stuff. That whole town, ta- like they built a town. The buildings were surrounded by green screen, big mm-hmm. time, and I, I felt it in this movie, and uh, and I felt like this doesn't feel real. This doesn't feel Lord of the Ringish. Like you look at Bree, you look at Bree. That was an actual town that they built. Yeah, another example where they went too far with CGI. It feels feels claustrophobic. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, I was gonna say about the master and the the master of Lake Town and his grimoth. I don't remember even remember the character's name. What was his name? I, I don't recall. Yeah. But I, I was getting a complete Soderman and Grim and Worm Tongue. <laughs> Except not quite so evil. No, more he, more mischievous. Yeah, he seemed to be some he seems to be using Thorin. Because it, if nothing more, it seems like he's gonna he's there's gonna be some sort of a conspiracy to to possibly get his hands on that gold or something like Possibly, that. Possibly, although it doesn't he doesn't strike me as that intelligent. Really? No. Well we'll see what happens. Maybe he wakes yeah. out in the well I think I think is gonna do him in. I think he's gonna be the first <laughs> the first victim. You were worried that Thorin was not gonna really trust Bill all that much. Did you feel like they handled that whole thing pretty well? I felt no. like they did. Yeah, no, I think I think it did real well. The trailer gave me the impression that there was going to be a huge mistrust between them, but but no, I think the movie carried it on from where the last movie left off. I think it they you you obviously saw some trust there, but um, but we still saw that there was there was some hindrance on on Thorin's side. It's like you know, okay, I, I trust you, I see that you're a good guy and everything, but he still kind of has his own interest. In mind. Yeah, well, and I wanted to bring this up because there's this whole thing with the Arkenstone, and if you remember from the first movie, his grandfather, I don't know if that was his ring, his precious type of ordeal, where it was, it, it corrupted him. It seems like it, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if in some way it, that's having, that desire to have that piece of, um, that, that jewel uh, back in his custody if it's beginning to take an effect on him, you know what I mean? The the moment where you see him draw his sword against Bilbo, you can get this sense that he's not either something... We don't know what's going through his head, but there's something wrong there. Something is having an effect on him. Agreed, yeah. It's definitely a couple steps back, and it kind of proves Smog's point to Bilbo there that he doesn't really care about him that much. It's more about his kingdom. yeah. He, and he's willing to use anything at, at his disposal to get what he wants. Yeah. Now, um, now we go. Let's go into the highlight of this movie. I think Smaug is the pillar of this film. A very, very strong pillar. Benedict Gumberpatch, I thought, did an amazing job with the voice. Oh, yeah, I and, agree. And the motion capture performance. And I was shocked when they said in interviews that he had done the motion capture. I was, I was like, what is there for you to do physically? I just seriously, right? Yeah. I would be. I'm very curious to see some behind the scenes footage with, uh, uh, with and how they pulled that off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering. And I would be curious to see if he was like in a sound stage, in a in a similar. Um, yeah. Did they sta- build a, a miniature set for him to move around in? Or yeah, what did yeah, they do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what did What did you think of that whole scene? I, it was it was a really good scene. It it really had me. Uh, on the edge of my seat there. I'm, I'm like, really scared for Bilbo. Oh, it's yeah. It's like, oh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I kept putting myself in his shoes. It's like, man, I'd be petrified to be there right now. He, and, th- and of course, it's it's the interaction. Mm-hmm. Let me say this. The interaction between the two actors worked tremendously. And that, when we were in the theater, 
when <laughs> when Bibble was walking away from from uh, from Balin, the theater just went to silence. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay. I mean, this is this is dangerous. This is you know big deal here. Yeah. Not just that, but this is a a pretty significant moment from the book. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a definitely, well, it's like the last film with the uh, riddles in the dark. You know, yes. it's an extremely anticipated yes. scene. Yeah. Yes. And I think they pulled it off so well. Mm -hmm. And he actually looked far better than what I was expecting. Him oh, yeah. Uh, you, now, you saw the trailer, right? The one where, the, where with... Um, yeah, where they sh showed kind of his head there breathing fire. No, yeah. uh, actually, no. Him, him coming over, to, him coming over to the side, and then he and Bilbo. And yeah, then his face is still kind of covered in darkness. You don't really get a good sense of his his face. And I, I, I honestly thought they had revealed way too much mm -hmm. in that scene. In 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 the uh, in the trailer, but here it was it was way more different than what I thought. I I, I don't know whether to call him. The definitive movie dragon. <laughs> I don't know if I can call him that. Mm -hmm. But he was so amazing to look at that he could possibly be that. And yeah. mm -hmm. and just the um, and all the and all the great lines from the book that him and him and Bilbo talk about, like you know, like um, oh yeah, Bilbo's flattery and yeah, yeah, and, yeah, where he where Bilbo's telling him. Oh, Smaug the stupendous, and and yeah. and then the nickname part, you know, where he says, "I'm the the ring bearer, the uh, the 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 barrel rider, yeah, and um and uh, the spider killer, something like that." I, I can't, but uh that was that was such a great moment. And when they went in for that wide shot with um between him, where he's uh, between him and and Smaug, where Smaug's still asleep. Oh, yeah. And, and Bilbo's trying to size him up a little bit. I will say this. Martin Freeman... I wouldn't be shocked, shocked if uh, Martin Freeman has studied Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. <laughs> it was really good, yeah. <laughs> but, oh my gosh. That is, that, is, that is my favorite scene in this whole movie that, that I felt was very, very weak. But it was, it was probably the best scene. Ever. And honestly, when when they did the whole Moria, uh, or not Moria, um, some of the um, some of the the Lonely Mountain stuff, that was where I thought the movie was going to really get start going. It was gonna okay, this is where things are gonna get better. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, after this magnificent scene, this amazing magnificent scene, it goes downhill. Again, it, it did a little bit there, in, in my opinion. Even though I loved it, I it did it didn't quite capture it as well. No, I mean, <clears throat> you have this again, very video gameish over CGI, and a scene that kind of reminded me of uh, of a, from a video game. It, it kind of mm -hmm. reminded me of something from like uh, the Legend of, of Zelda, <laughs> <laughs> and. I'm thinking to myself, how much room is there in the Lonely Mountain? <laughs> Seriously, but yeah. This, this, this was. I don't well, know. I mean, it gives you a sense of just how grand that kingdom was back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> and how much, how many stairs they built and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, what follows is this very weird climax that i think was a very weak climax and yeah i agree and what what was it again he you basically they they basically go to this um uh in uh, i guess a uh, fiery inferno or something yeah. like that and and they start melting the gold and i thought they were going to use medieval techniques where you would boil these hot cauldrons and then you would pour it against your enemies when when like when smaug's there at the gate trying to bust through it, I mm -hmm. thought they were going to pour, I thought that somehow it was going to pour out and then it was going to scold him. Yeah. But no, what it turns into this is this over the top, <laughs> this over the top um, molding that, <laughs> that didn't really, 
go no, I didn't I didn't expect that, no. I didn't expect it either, but I was just What? Yeah, I it's was like just... how did you expect to kill him now? That it it, it was it was kind of B grade in the in the setup. It's like okay, everything had to work just perfectly in order for it to actually, you know, result in him dying. Yeah. And, the, and in the book, it's just, it's simple. It's a very simple, he, after um, Bibble escapes, he, uh, uh, Smaug just rises from the yeah. mountain. Yeah, they don't really get a chance to attempt to fight him. He just leaves. Yeah, yeah. he leaves really quickly because he knows that he, uh, because Bibble does stay to him that it's revenge and he is under the and he's under the impression that that lake town is conspiring against yes. him yes but exactly. uh, but then he finds thorin and then there's that whole sequence in the in the movie where he's chasing them and all that stuff and you, you i felt the gold stuff was horrible even same when, here and even when even when thorin is getting like he, what, what is it uh, when thorin uses the wheelbarrow that looked horrible that looked horrible. It it felt oh. like it. It felt like everything was so perfectly staged to to work. I mean, there was there was no um there was no any anything could have just gone slightly wrong and it would have messed up the whole thing. It had to be all just perfectly. There was no room for error. No. And and that's just that's not what you want to have when you're when you're combating someone you don't want to have everything so precisely calculated that there's no room for error because there's always going to be an error yeah. so it didn't it didn't really it didn't work no i thought that they were going to do something like a um uh what's that name of that creature from uh from uh greek or roman mythology the the, the uh yeah yeah mm -hmm. is, it, is it called minotaur it's it's, it's it's minotaur monitor yeah whatever how monitor. you pronounce it yeah 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 and i i thought we were going to go through the sequence where the dwarves were going to be in like a situation where they're going to go through like, like uh, where Mori was going to become like this maze and they were mm -hmm. going to have to try to find ways of getting out and I'm kind of uh, I, I was I was what followed what we just said just didn't it work. was it was definitely the weak point of the film yes mm -hmm. and then <laughs> the ending and uh, this is how I sum up the movie what have we done? That's how I feel about this movie. <laughs> yeah, I love. I love how they keep giving Bilbo the most comical last words to the film. You know, in in, in uh, Unexpected Journey, it was you know I do believe the worst is behind us, and this one it's what have we done? <laughs> and it parallels the film. Yes, that it parallels the similarity of my question towards the filmmakers. What have you done? <laughs> Did, were you shocked that? Once Smaug rises, which look, I'll say this about the gold stuff. I thought it was awesome that he's get he gets covered in gold. It was pretty cool. And yeah. then he and I thought he was going to be that permanently. Yeah. Well, I mean, they couldn't they couldn't leave the gold on him. If they had done that, then there would have been no no um, weak point in his armor. It actually, would have been reinforced even further. So they couldn't they couldn't leave him covered covered in gold because then the arrow would have never pierced him. It, it, and then I think I think is it is it right there that it cuts or is it with Bilbo? Bibble's line that it cuts. No, it's it's smog that it that it cuts on. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I th I think I can't I can't recall now. They're very close to each it other. Was, it was three a.m. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my theater started booing. At that really? Point. Yes. What about your theater? Um. Well, there wasn't there wasn't any clapping, but there was certainly no booing. It was just kind of a okay. Oh. That's it. Uh, I know on my part, I was I was genuinely surprised. It ended right there. I was expecting a lot more. So it's like, oh, that's the end. Okay, which like that falls in line with what we were talking about last time. It's like if they go if they go as far as we thought they were going to go, then what else is there left? Well, he's left a lot to yeah. do for the third movie. Yeah. So yeah. it's actually it was a good point to leave it at. Well, I, and, but I thought we were going to get. I thought we were going to wrap up the whole Smaug stuff. I know, that's what I expected too, but he decided not to do that, which leaves a lot for the third movie, yeah. which I do like. Which, and that kind of shows me right there that they don't really have much left. They, they, they don't, yeah, yeah. I can't, I don't see... Yeah, it, it does mean that that last battle there is, it's not going to be all we, 
anticipate it to be. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Or it is going to be big. It's just, well, I, honestly, after through, going through this whole movie, I am so worried about the third film. <laughs> I, I swear to you, I am so worried. Well, I'm worried about it too, but in a slightly different way. I'm worried about the whole introduction of Sauron thing. How are they going to leave that undone? Because obviously it has to be left hanging. They can't properly resolve all of it, which bugs me. Because that's the one thing that Tolkien did so well, is that when he ended a book, he wrapped up pretty much everything. And so that leaving that overhanging, how are they going to leave that hanging in a way that satisfies us as the audience, but leaves it hanging enough to make sense for the fellowship to pick up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think what we're going to – well, do you know what actually occurs in that particular uh, point in time during uh, – with with Delgador? Do you know what happens there? I, I don't recall. It's been a while since I read. Okay. I mean, I, I, I believe that at that point in time – no, Sauron, Sauron had not yet moved to Mordor yet. He sneaks in a little bit later. Yes. Um, he, he's, I believe he sneaks in during that time after The Hobbit, not too long before Fellowship picks up. And then, and then Fellowship has like his 60-year span yeah. that Frodo stays in the Shire before he actually begins his journey. Yeah. What, what, in the book, in the book, or actually in the appendices, um, Sauron is actually forced out of Del Godor. Well, and again, the movie is setting that up. In it a way. is, yeah. It's setting that up because, well, one, Gandalf is still in prison there. I think Legolas is going to be the one to save him, from the looks of it. That's possible. I hadn't, I hadn't given that any thought yet. Yeah, yeah. because I, he's following that orc, and he's going back to um, Dagador. But uh, oh, yeah. here's another thing I want to bring up. Uh, Lee Pace as the Elven King. It was great to see that character because that's a character that um, that I've kind of liked uh, as well. Um, did he give the? I'm trying to remember again. I only saw the movie once. Now, does he speak of anything about or hinting that he wants to take the uh, the kingdom for himself, the the the, the Lonely Mountain? No, he he doesn't. He does give the impression though that he covets. Um... Uh, some of the stones. So I mean, the Arkenstone in particular, I believe. Yes. Um, so he he does he does covet that. He he kind of has his eye on that that he he wants. He doesn't give the impression though that he would take over. Yeah. The, the kingdom yet. He he kind of wants to be equal with Thorin if Thorin manages to take it back. Yeah. And and they, and they do make that deal. But well, no 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 no. They don't make that deal. No he, no. Thorin Thorin throws it back in his face. Yes. In the book it. What it really comes down to with these three major characters, Thorin, Bard, and the Elven King, yeah, they become mm -hmm. greedy individuals. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like they really set that up very well in in the. I think they set that up very well with Thorin, but with but with Bard. Well, with well, for for some of them, is it is it so much a motive of greed or is it a motive of entitlement? Because for Bard, it could be entitlement. I mean, he, the people there have put up with suffering since Dale's destruction. Yes, that's true. So he, he may feel entitled to that gold. I, yeah, I think, I think you're right about that. I'm, I'm sorry. It's been such a long time since I've read the, um, <clears throat> the book, but I thought Same it was. here, yeah. They could play with that. The, this one, again, it's the whole idea that, that this third film is, is going to be short and manage to put that in there. In, mm -hmm. the, in the movie. If you waken that beast, it will destroy us all. You can listen to this naysayer, but I promise you this. If we succeed, all will share in the wealth of the mountain. <laughs> you will have enough gold to rebuild Eskaroth ten times over! Uh, but anyway, I will just say this as a closing <clears throat> thought. Um, Lord, I think this is where Peter Jackson was off his game uh, significantly. Um, it makes me worried about what's going to happen next year. If things are going to be far more worse than what they were, uh, than what they than what I saw here. Um, I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping that 
Phoenix can improve. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because there's a lot of emotional stuff in mm-hmm. the in this final half of the book. The third. Yeah, there is. And it's got to be done delicately. Yeah, you know, hey, it is what it is. I'll I'll give it another shot in theaters. I'll, yeah, I'll give it another shot in theaters. I will, um, and maybe the three, and maybe if I see it again, it will help me help me appreciate it a little bit more. But as of right now, I was so disappointed with this movie, and uh, such a such a sad note to end on on the. <laughs> Of a week, actually, because I, I, I spent... Such a highly expected, anticipated movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and... Uh, but anyway, go ahead and give your closing thoughts. <sighs> I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I laughed when I was supposed to, and I and I uh, uh, was afraid when I was supposed to, and, and I felt pretty engaged with it. I... My... My... Quibbles with it is... Um, is the overuse of CG. I think some practical effects, practical sets, would have helped it immensely and made it more engaging. Um, the tale is not one of epic proportions. It was not designed to be. No. And so because of that, it um, it's not going to be one that I've marked down as a favorite. No, uh, I, I think it's... But it's certainly one that I will enjoy um, having on my shelf. And uh, and uh, enjoy watching it and laughing about it uh, with with other people. So, um, I liked it. I would recommend it. I would not tell people to expect it to be amazing. I would say it's it's a great movie, and it's cer- certainly something that you should see if you want to. Um, uh, you know, have have a fun have a fun tale. It is a little bit long. I don't think it felt as long as the first one, though. Okay. I think it flowed a little bit better. And 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 Peter Jackson hasn't lost my trust yet. I still, I still have hope for the third film. And I think. <clears throat> he has the I think I think he can pull off the third film okay. It's just there's some things that it's going to be very tricky. I can tell. Yeah. I, I can tell you right now that he's going to probably go overboard again with the CGI because that, he, he that does seem to be that's the trend. He's not going to go back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's impossible. He can't go back now. I mean, that's the way he shot it. Yeah. And I am. Um... So we'll just have to get used to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that will do it for this edition of the uh, the Story to Screen podcast. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, ben, uh, thank you for coming onto the show. It's been great uh, talking to you about these movies. You're welcome. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Yes, and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime in the future. There's there's plenty to look forward to. Uh, I'm just sad that it, it, it from on my, on my end that it, it didn't end as spectacularly <laughs> as I hoped it could have. <laughs> As, a, as much as I hope you could have, but um, but anyway, um, thank you very much, man, for taking the time to to come onto the show, and uh, hopefully no we'll uh, we'll do it again in the future. So yeah, thank you for inviting me. You're you're welcome. Uh, so that will do it for this episode of the Story to Screen podcast. You can just you can find us online on uh, on Facebook and like us on there. Uh, and that'll be it then. Uh, thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen, and we hope you have a good night. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye.